in cold Romania. Behind me is today's location. It's pretty dark to film in there, but luckily it's pretty picturesque outside. We're going to be talking all about getting optimum sharpness in architectural photography in any camera and lens combination. Let's crack on. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is James Kerwin and this is me. I'm an architecture and interior photographer from the UK and I love shooting abandoned places, relics, ruins, hidden gems and ghost towns, as well as off the beaten path locations all around the world. I'm posting new videos every Sunday, so why don't you join me for the ride by subscribing. You can also check out my website in the description below. And as you can see, it is another colorful gem. If you haven't seen the video from last week, we talked all about color in architecture. I'm gonna link it up above. Um, but it's another beauty, as you can see. It's fallen to bits somewhat, so if you hear noises surrounding me, you know why. I've had to light it up artificially with, uh, for myself so we can see what we're talking about in here. But it's an absolute beauty. It's a crumbling one in the middle of nowhere, as you saw in the intro. Um, but there is some tips that I wanna give you all based on trying to get sharp images, as sharp as possible in architecture photography. And following on from the previous week, the first tip for today is to use a tripod. For those of you who missed that video, I talked all about my own tripod. I'm gonna again link it above. But using a tripod in architecture really is the best for portfolio level work, it goes without saying. There is a time and a place for handheld architecture shots, but I think when we're talking about trying to get the optimum sharpness, a tripod is the only real way to go. It allows you, of course, to be able to lower your ISO, increase your aperture, say to the lens's sharpest point, and of course then get the two second timer on to take your time, compose your image, stand away from the tripod and get the sharpest possible results. So of course a tripod then is gonna be tip number one, even if it is something as flimsy as this Benro Slim right here. By the way, on a side note, I'm shooting with ISO 8000 in my Canon R5. <laughs> Pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> 4K, ISO 8000. Awesome. Even with a light on, 8000. Shows you how dark this space is. Another reason why a tripod is essential. Okay, the next one, the next tip is going to be using or selecting your lens's sharpest aperture. Now, I've got another video coming up on this channel in a couple of weeks where I'm going to be talking about aperture mistakes. The reason why I say use your lens's sharpest aperture is because stopping it down uh, all the way, say, to 11 or 16, you start to get things like diffraction problems and the lens isn't in, at its optimum performance. I know uh, from doing various tests over the years, that this lens, this is my 17mm Canon tilt shift lens, its optimum sharpness is at f8. That means edge to edge sharpness, as well as in the center, so on and so forth. If I want to increase my depth of field, I normally focus stack or do other techniques in camera, but that's again a topic for another day. If you stop down to f11 with a Canon R5 and this tilt shift lens, it's very unlikely you're going to probably even notice the difference. It's still going to be incredibly, incredibly sharp because of the combination of the two. But if you start using lenses and camera combinations that are cheaper or you're just starting out, when you're using those kind of cheaper bodies, not, no, not so much, but the cheaper lenses definitely, you're gonna start noticing all kinds of issues when you're stopping down to f16 as an example. And there really is no need. It's all about distance to the sensor. And in architecture, you're very rarely miles away. So stopping it down to the sharpest point of the lens, not only is it beneficial to 
getting your sharpest results, but also in terms of exposure time, we're in a dark church, and also keeping that ISO low, but actually making sure your shutter speed isn't gonna take weeks and weeks and weeks. So yeah, lens's sharpest point, F8 on this one, and that's the lens we're gonna be using today to grab our shot of this church. So just as I was setting up my camera there, I just popped into my head that actually you can test the lens's sharpest aperture. Uh, there's a few things you can do actually. You can download a little kit and you can do, do some tests for yourself to find out the lens and camera combinations sharpest aperture for your gear. Um, and I do recommend doing that, but a good rule of thumb is usually f7.1 to f9, especially on wider lenses for architecture, does tend to be this aperture range for the sharpest optimum quality before you start getting into some weird artifacting, especially on those cheaper lenses, like the one that I'm shooting on here. This is a, what is this? A 10, a 10 to 18 mil on the M50. So the whole point of having your camera on a tripod is to eliminate shake. So, of course, that means that if we're gonna use the tripod, we should probably utilize the two second or in-camera timer for two seconds or use a remote release to do 10 seconds or select 10 seconds in camera or whatever your camera can do to eliminate shake wobble and to make sure we're getting the sharpest results. It goes without saying. So once we've got the camera on the tripod, we can then use the second timer in camera. I recommend you looking up your camera brand as to how you put it on if you don't know. But this can really, really benefit you from stopping knocking the camera as you're trying to take those photos or you'll be surprised actually even just rocking on the floorboards nearby i in architecture normally set my camera up i put my 10 second timer on if the floorboards or something around me is is quite wobbly or unstable if not i put a concrete floor two second timer and just get away from that tripod and camera get my hands off it and that's going to help you significantly to get sharper results Okay, so the next tip as I go to shoot before we lose light altogether is to make sure you're selecting the right settings for the scene. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a number of things to bear in mind. Have we got any movement in the scene? Have we got enough light? Do we need to increase the ISO? There's lots of things that we need to bear in mind as we're, as we're trying to make sure we get the optimum sharpness. Settings need to be pretty perfect for that. You don't need to, for example, boost your ISO right up unnecessarily, or in some instances, even get it too low. The optimum might actually be to stick it up at say 200 or 400, depending on what the scene allows. Here, we've got a static subject. However, it's quite dark. It doesn't mean we should boost our ISO too high. I wanna keep it around 400. So that means not 100 because actually, that would make my shutter speed, in fact, I'll tell you exactly what it'll make my shutter speed. 100 would make my shutter speed 10 seconds, which I think is too long for this scene. There's light coming in there and it's gonna decrease the quality of the image. So I'm actually gonna use my camera's ability to have a, you know, amazing ISO in this R5. I'm gonna basically be able to boost that up to 400. I'm gonna select what I need in there and I'm gonna go for it there. Three brackets, one stop over, I'm just going to put that there to stop the light coming in as <laughs> it's filming with me. And you can see already my longest one. And I'm happier with that. That's actually great. Like we've got three brackets there. Uh, in fact, one is probably even then a little bit too bright still. So I'm just going to, again, block the light. Perfect. Don't always keep your ISO really low just because, well, you're in, you're in an architecture spot and you want and you want a tripod. Sometimes you do need to increase the ISO to get the resolution and to get the sharpness that you desire. A shutter speed of 30 seconds, for example, is not as sharp as a shutter speed of just four or five seconds. Uh, it just goes without saying, if you're letting the light on the center a long time, that can take away from some of that sharpness, the optimum sharpness we're talking about. The next thing that I want to check about is now we've taken our photos is we, we want to do is look on the back of the LCD and just double check and we can zoom in using the magnifying glass icon on the Canons, zoom on in, literally check and literally go right through the scene and just double check that 
everything that we want is tack sharp on here. Of course, you could attach something like a, a tablet or phone or check with a bigger screen. But a three inch screen, if you zoom right in, you should be able to check that it is nice and sharp. And you want to be able to do front to back sharpness. If your camera is an entry level camera, another thing you could do, or even entry level lenses to that matter, is actually use manual focus. Especially in dark environments like this, autofocus could be playing up, or your lens and camera combination might not have been calibrated for a while. You might not have synced them together. Many people don't know that. You can actually sync your lens and camera together to get the optimum sharpness for that lens and camera combination. And many people don't do this. So use manual focus. Use the icon here, the magnifying icon. Zoom around, check the bit you want to focus on. Use manual, front element of the lens here. And that is a much more surefire way of getting the sharpness where you want it in the scene. For example, say you want to focus at these columns and you do so with autofocus, but it's slightly off. It could be actually going past it and uh, back focusing somewhat. And that means that your focusing is more towards the back of the church than you're going to be missing the front elements, sharpness, and that's what we want here, front to back sharpness. The next tip, and this is one of the most important ones, is to focus in the correct area of the image. We've got a bit of an advantage in this church. The columns just behind me here are a third of the way into the scene. So that means if we focus on those, everything behind that would be in focus. So in this scene, that is perfect to do. I'm gonna just point out that here so you can see these are the columns. If you focused here, because of the distance between the column and the lens, everything behind that would be in focus. If, in some environments, you might not have those columns there, it might just be square walls, then focusing just on the back wall or anything from that point onwards will also work absolutely fine. Where it gets trickier is if you've got something closer to the front of the lens, the front element of the lens. And if there's something, say, just down here, then that's gonna cause you a lot of problems then you're going to need to think about other ways to do stuff. Focus stacking is a great example. You might need to be able to focus on the front and the back and join those images together in Photoshop. Yeah, so making sure that you've focused exactly in the right area is going to give you optimum sharpness as well. It's going to help towards creating sharp images in architecture. Okay, that wraps us up. I need to get moving because I need to get this car out of the valley cool little location shame i couldn't get as much b-roll as i wanted it's pretty dark inside but you get the idea very picturesque i love it out here it's peace and quiet see hope you've enjoyed the video enjoy the rest of your weekend goodbye for now